Seizures are common. When they first happen, people often feel that they're alone, but they're not. One in 10 of us are going to have a seizure at some point during our lifetime. Seizures happen for lots of different reasons. In children, one of the commonest causes are children when they're sick with a high fever, can have a febrile convulsion. Adults can have them too, but the pediatric brain is particularly susceptible to seizures. People can have seizures after a blow to the head or a concussion. And anytime someone is really sick, recovering from anesthesia, they're prone to having seizures. But sometimes people have recurrent seizures, and that's epilepsy. And that occurs in one in 26 people. So epilepsy is amazingly common. And for as poorly understood it is it, as it is by our profession, as well as the lay public, it's, it's really disheartening that there's not more research and more understanding of this really common condition. It's more common than Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and muscular dystrophy all added together. Epilepsy is creeping up on all of us. So it's very common in the first year of life. Then it drifts down through childhood. And then most of us here in the room are enjoying the time in our life when epilepsy is the least likely to start. And then it starts to go up as we get older. Obviously, the reasons in early childhood are different than the reasons that an older person might develop epilepsy, which would be more likely related to strokes, brain tumors, and diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Seizures are due to an abnormal electrical discharge in the brain. Our brains work on electrical signaling, and if there is an excessive discharge of electrical activity in the brain, it results in a seizure. Seizures can look like anything. Anything that our brain can do, think, feel, see, move, can be a seizure. And depending on how much of the brain is involved and which parts of the brain in, are involved will determine what those seizures look like. Some seizures are very, very obvious. If someone has a grand mal seizure or a convulsion, they stiffen, fall to the ground, and jerk and shake. And there are a few things that would get confused with a grand mal seizure. But other seizures are much smaller and can involve staring, giggling or laughter, different kinds of sensations, seeing things, feeling things, deja vu experiences may all be manifestations of a seizure. So sometimes there is a big delay in the recognition that someone's having seizures because the events aren't what a lot of people, including a lot of doctors, think seizures could be. In general, seizures follow certain rules. They tend to be brief. So most seizures last seconds to a minute or two, although they can last a long time. Long seizures lasting longer than 30 minutes are referred to as status epilepticus. And there are people that have a continuous seizure that can last for years. So our brain has an endless capacity to generate seizures under the right or, I guess, the wrong circumstances. But most times, seizures are short. They're stereotyped, so every seizure should look the same. People can have more than one type of seizure, but each individual type of seizure should look the same. If it's epilepsy, the seizures are repetitive. So the child will have that same stereotyped change in behavior or movement or feeling or sensation that occurs over and over again. Seizures can happen once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day, once a minute. And most seizures are associated with an abnormal EEG or electrical recording of the brain. And the EEG is one of our most important tools for understanding and characterizing and classifying seizures in epilepsy. Most people have, with epilepsy have an abnormal EEG in between seizures, and then during the seizure, most of the time the EEG is abnormal, but not always. There's a couple of different classification <coughs> systems of seizures in epilepsy, and this is always changing. Um, the uh, one that's been around for quite a long time is through the, all the classifications are through the International League Against Epilepsy. And uh, 
This is one from 1981 that is still used today, although the terminology is, is changing a little bit. But we think of seizures based on consciousness. So if someone loses consciousness and is completely passes out, it's a generalized seizure, and usually the EEG activity is everywhere in the brain. If you don't lose consciousness, then the seizure is involving only part or a region of the brain, and those are referred to as partial or focal seizures. If your consciousness is completely normal during the seizure, those are simple partial seizures and in the vernacular are often referred to as auras. And if your consciousness is impaired or altered, those are referred to as complex partial seizures. Not everything that is stereotyped and repetitive and occurs suddenly is a seizure. So there are a lot of things in childhood that sometimes gets confused as seizures. And um, the doctors here have all seen patients that have come in on seizure medicines for an evaluation of possible surgery because the medicines aren't working, only to find out that the spells that are being treated aren't actually seizures. In babies, um, reflux is pretty common. And you can imagine if you're a baby laying there, you've just nursed and you're feeling pretty good and suddenly you have reflux of your stomach contents up your throat and it, that burning acid comes up to the back of your throat. And if you're a baby, you go like this and you stiffen and it can look a lot like a seizure. Fainting spells are passing out. The medical term for that is syncope and that can be confused for epileptic seizures. We all have little jerks and twitches when we sleep. That's normal, but sometimes those can be confused as seizures. Um, toddlers can have episodes that are called breath-holding spells where they're suddenly startled or hurt and they get stuck and they can't get a breath out and they turn blue and uh, they can pass out and uh, those are sometimes confused as seizures. Children can have bad dreams or other episodes during sleep that can be confused as seizures. And then rarely in childhood, and a little bit older, or a little bit common as we get older, are psychiatric or psychological events that uh, can look like a seizure. Those are sometimes referred to as pseudo-seizures. This is what an EEG would look like with somebody having a generalized seizure. That's 10 seconds of time, uh, and uh, the blue is on the left side of the head, the red is on the right side of the head, and you can see that high amplitude spike and slow wave is everywhere. So that's a generalized seizure and that person would be unconscious during that seizure. And that's what we typically see when somebody has an absence seizure. This is another child with 10 seconds of EEG. And again, it's left, right, left, right. And you can see that there's something different on this side than here. You see this nice little rhythm back here that is not very well seen here. So something is wrong on the right side of this child's brain. And then the seizure begins, and it starts here on the right side. You can see how it's building up. So that's a focal seizure or a partial seizure. And then within 20 seconds, it's everywhere. So if somebody walked in the room and the child was having this seizure at this moment, you wouldn't know, did it start everywhere at the beginning and it was a generalized seizure from onset, or did the child have an aura and it began as a partial seizure and then secondarily generalized? And it's really important for us to sort that out. And that's why we sometimes need to bring children into the monitoring unit to sort out how the seizure begins and where it begins. And this child has an abnormality right here at the back of the brain on the right-hand side. And as opposed to where a hypothalamic hamartoma is, this would be a pretty straightforward surgery. So medicines don't always work. <coughs> um, there's an official definition of what uncontrolled epilepsy is. That means that someone has tried two of the correct drugs for their type of epilepsy, and they're still having seizures. So if someone has had two or three good drug trials and are still having seizures, the likelihood that medicines are going to control the seizures starts getting really, really small. Some types of seizures respond better to medicines than other types. And unfortunately, gelastic seizures do not tend to respond well to medicine. This is a famous research study that uh, was done in Scotland. And uh, they took almost 800 patients 
with newly diagnosed epilepsy and put them on the best drug that they had for their type of epilepsy. And they found that half the people in blue became completely seizure free for two years on that drug therapy. And so those are people that responded. If they didn't respond to that first drug, then they tried a second drug, which are the people in uh, the sort of reddish color. And they got another 11% of the people seizure free. And then after that, with every drug trial, they got almost no one else seizure free. So a third of the people never stopped having seizures. So those are the people that are surgical candidates. Uh, they have medically refractory or medically intractable epilepsy. And you could tell after two drugs who was going to respond to drug therapy and who wasn't. In fact, the number one predictor of being in purple was not being in blue. So if you fail your first drug, it makes it really unlikely that a drug is ever going to work. And unfortunately, children with gelastic seizures are almost always in purple. The seizures just don't stop with medicine. So that's in a research study, what's happening in real life? Because in real life, they're not seeing an epileptologist, they're not going to a major medical center. You know, most epilepsy in the United States and around the world is treated by pediatricians and general neurologists and family doctors. And so they don't always get the right diagnosis. They don't always put them on the right medicine. And I know as hard as it is to believe, not everybody takes the medicine that's prescribed to them. Um, many times people don't take their seizure medicines because they forget. People with epilepsy have memory troubles. And the medicines have lots of side effects. And so some people would rather have seizures than have the side effects of the seizure medicines. So this was a survey through the Epilepsy Foundation with you know, the same size as uh, Dr. Brody's study, you know, almost 800 patients. And they asked, are you having seizures and are you having side effects from your therapy? And here, in real life, there were only 32% of people that were seizure-free. And unfortunately, most people are in red, which is they're still having seizures and they're having side effects. So although I hear it all the time that people say the incidence of uncontrollable epilepsy is 30%, that's in a research study, but in real life, I think about two-thirds of people living with epilepsy are still having seizures. So our treatment goals for epilepsy are to stop the seizures. So if we've just diagnosed epilepsy, we're going to sort out what kind of epilepsy it is, what the cause of it is, and then put them on what we think is our best drug to stop the seizures. So our goal is seizure freedom, and we're going to try one or two drugs to do that. But if the seizures don't stop, then the child or the adult has refractory or intractable epilepsy. And the, really the first step is to do EEG video monitoring to understand are these really seizures because sometimes seizures aren't stopping because they're not seizures, they're something else. And then to sort out whether they can have surgery. And our first goal in people with uncontrolled seizures is to see if we can do surgery because that offers the hope of seizure freedom. And if you can't do surgery, then it's control therapy. And it's always better to cure if you can. But if you can't, there's other ways to help control seizures and that's additional drugs, vagus nerve stimulation, and the ketogenic diet <clears throat> that can all really improve quality of life but it's not like curing epilepsy. So how are we doing in the United States? This is just a snapshot overview of how many people get epilepsy surgery in the United States. You know, you think we're a pretty sophisticated medical system here that if people have a condition that could benefit from surgery, they'd be getting surgery. So if you look at uh, the incidence of epilepsy, there's about three million people in the United States that have active epilepsy. And conservatively speaking, a third of them have uncontrolled seizures. So that means that there's a million people right now today 
in the United States that have uncontrolled seizures. So that's a million people that could be having surgery right now. And uh, we're only doing about 3,000 brain surgeries for epilepsy and about 3,500 vagus nerve stimulations. So you've got a million people and only seven or 8,000 are getting surgery. So there's a big treatment gap. There's 150,000 new cases of epilepsy diagnosed in the United States every year, and 50,000 of those are going to be uncontrollable. So we're not even treading water. We're doing a tiny fraction of surgeries compared to the people that need this therapy. And unfortunately, on average, people live with uncontrolled seizures for 20 years before they get surgery. There's lots of different types of surgery. The curative ones are surgically removing part of the brain or ablating or destroying part of the brain. And you'll be hearing more about those surgical treatments by other speakers a little bit later. There's other surgeries that can help control seizures, but they don't cure them. Those are called palliative surgeries, and that includes a corpus callosotomy or a brain disconnection procedure, and then the stimulation therapies, which is vagus nerve stimulation and RNS, or responsive neurostimulation, also referred to as neuropace. Epilepsy surgery works. There's been scientific studies that have proven it, um, and uh, the best study was done in Canada um, and showed that uh, people that got surgery did much better than people that stayed on medicine and there was one unfortunate death in that study, and it was in a person that was in the medicine group, not in the surgery group. So what about HH? Hamartomas can be anywhere in your body. A hypothalamic hamartoma is a hamartoma in your hypothalamus. But you can have hamartomas in your skin, you can have them in your bones, you can have them in your eyes. They can be anywhere in your body. And it's, hamartomas are basically normal tissue in the wrong place. So they're different than brain tumors that are a new growth in the brain or a neoplasia. It's abnormal tissue. For the most part, HHs or hamartomas of any type are completely normal tissue. They're just in a place where it's not supposed to be. It's rare, about one in a million people have an HH. And they usually present with gelastic seizures. Gelastic is derived from the Greek word gilos, which means laughter. And uh, the laughter associated with gelastic seizures is a mirthless laughter. So it's not associated with anything being funny. They're not laughing because um, they're amused. And it's a laughter, or often it's a giggling. It often has a forced uh, quality to it. And uh, many times it's... Uh, kind of sinister um, or sardonic in its quality. Um, and it's usually ident easily identified by the caregivers as distinct from the child's behavioral laughter. So if they hear laughter without seeing the child, they can still tell whether they're playing next door laughing or having a seizure. These seizures usually begin early in infancy, and many times they begin in the first weeks of life. And uh, often they're not recognized as being abnormal, sometimes for years and years. And many times not until the child starts to have other types of seizures. Then they get an evaluation for the other seizure types, they get an MRI, somebody sees the HH, and then the doctors say, oh, does your child have unusual laughing episodes because he has this rare abnormality in his brain. Occasionally, the gelastic seizures will be recognized as being abnormal early on, but most of the time it's not for years. And some children also have crying seizures, which are dacristic seizures. So that's an HH right in the middle of the brain. You really couldn't be more in the complete center of the brain than where HHs are. So you can imagine the challenges of surgeons trying to get to this without injuring the surrounding normal brain. And this is right at the intersection of really critical and important functions in the brain. And there it is on a side view, the spinal cord coming up, 
the brain stem, this is the corpus callosum, and there's the HH right there. This is the face, mouth, tongue. There's different classification systems of uh, HH depending on their size and their shape. Delaland and Regi. Most people use the Regi classification. So the hypothalamus itself is right in the center of the brain and it's the main production center for hormones. So all the hormones that we use in our body to regulate our growth, ladies that regulate the menstrual cycle, um, all of those hormones that uh, uh, are so important for our body are created in the hypothalamus and then go to the pituitary that is attached, the pituitary gland that's attached to the hypothalamus. Controls, the hypothalamus also controls our appetite and our, our body temperature. If something goes wrong with the hypothalamus, you can have precocious puberty where puberty starts too early because you're secreting sex hormones too soon. And you can have, develop diabetes insipidus, which is an inability to regulate the salt content in your thirst. And so you end up with uh, peeing a lot and having very concentrated blood that can make you very sick. The hypothalamus is also intimately connected with critical important circuits that control our emotions, our behavior, our memory, and learning. So if something goes wrong in that region of the brain, it influences everything that makes us us. And it's very close to visual and motor pathways, the pituitary gland, and the major blood vessels of the brain. So it's in a terrifying part of the brain for surgeons. Because they're so deep, we often don't see abnormalities on the EEG. So as opposed to those examples that I showed you with that overlying uh, abnormality very close to the surface, many times HHs, even during a seizure, don't show up on a regular EEG. But because of these electrical connections, they disrupt so many functions. And they can propagate to the surface. Um, so before MRIs, and before HHs were even known to exist, children um, many times had a temporal lobe removed or a frontal lobe removed because that's where the doctors thought the seizures were coming from. But really they were coming from down deep and spreading up to the surface. Most HHs just happen on their own. They're not associated with anything else. So we call those non-syndromic or isolated. And uh, they're almost certainly a genetic abnormality, so a gene that that child has uh, inherited or a mutation that happened in that child's genes. And it probably involves something called the mTOR signaling pathway, which is a growth regulation pathway in our body. The commonest genetic cause for HH is Pallister-Hall syndrome, and the gene for that is known, uh, GLI-3 gene. And uh, if you have a mutation in that gene, you have Pallister Hall, which is associated with an HH, precocious puberty, and those children have extra uh, fingers and toes. As I said earlier, gelastic seizures start in infancy. They typically occur multiple times every day. They're usually associated with an HH, but you can have gelastic seizures coming from other parts of the brain. So it's important that children get a, a thorough evaluation. If they are going to come from somewhere else, it's usually the frontal or the temporal lobe. And because of those networks deep in the middle of the brain, gelastic epilepsy is associated with a progressive epileptic encephalopathy. So children tend to get worse over time, develop worsening learning problems and behavior problems. So they have a cognitive and intellectual decline over time if we can't stop the seizures. And the behavior becomes a real problem, and it can become very disruptive and aggressive. The seizures tend to worsen, and they can spread to other parts of the brain. And the seizures are nearly always medically intractable. Medicines just don't work for gelastic seizures, but they can work for the other kinds of seizures that these children may have. So in order to stop the gelastic seizures and the hope for interrupting this progressive epileptic encephalopathy and behavioral worsening, surgery is necessary. And surgeons over the decades have tried lots of different ways to approach this. 
the earliest types of surgery were uh, regular craniotomies where the surgeon opens the skull and goes down and tries to remove part of the HH. As you can imagine, that's difficult because this is so deep. Uh, then a very important uh, advance was uh, made by uh, and uh, promoted by Dr. Rakate, who is at the Barrow, is now in New York, and this was using an endoscope, so a small tube with a flashlight on the end um, that could go in without causing as much brain injury. Gamma knife has been tried for this, uh, which is focused radiation to try to destroy the HH with radiation therapy. And then uh, the most recent uh, development has been with using MRI-guided lasers. And uh, we did the first case of laser therapy for epilepsy in August five years ago. And our first HH case was four years ago. And uh, this is now becoming one of the main ways of treating HH because of the surgical precision. And we'll hear more about that by our other speakers. The world's biggest experience by far with the endoscopic approach is the Barrow uh, in Phoenix and showed that um, it had really pretty good success, um, but there were some complication rates. It was better than radio surgery. Um, so, in conclusion, refractory epilepsy with gelastic seizures due to hypothalamic hamartomas is a catastrophic disease, and it's one of the catastrophic epilepsies of childhood. Catastrophic means that this epilepsy is changing this child's future, affecting their ability to learn and live independently. Management must focus on qual maximizing quality of life, which means stopping the seizures, but not at any cost trying to minimize the side effects of whatever therapy we're doing, which is usually surgery. Anti-epileptic drugs are rarely helpful for gelastic seizures, but they can help with other seizure types. Surgical interventions need to be used as soon as possible. Surgery is really the only way we have of stopping these seizures. Exciting and innovative new treatments are rapidly emerging. And the best outcomes require a dedicated, committed team of caregivers, of the doctors, researchers, innovators, and advocates like the Hope for Hamartoma Foundation that is working hard to educate people, advocate for families and caregivers, bringing people together so that we can better understand why this happens to these children and how to make it better.